Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Adam Liao, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening for the inaugural Wang Gungwu Lecture, an initiative of the National Foundation for Australia-China Relations in partnership with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Tonight, we're here to promote and celebrate the substantial and long-standing contributions of Chinese Australians to Australian life. We're here to recognise our most successful Chinese Australians, and it's our hope that this lecture continues to grow to provide an enduring platform for discussion on what it means to be Chinese Australian today. Australia's relationship with people of Chinese ancestry who have come here to call this country home is a very long one. The first recorded migrant to Australia from China was Max Saying, later known as John Shying, who arrived from Guangzhou as a 20-year-old in 1818. He arrived along with John Blacksland as a free settler aboard the Laurel, landing at Port Jackson, which we now know as Sydney Harbour, Gadigal land, just a few kilometres north of where we are now. And Max Saying settled in Parramatta, just a few more kilometres to the west. He ran the Golden Lion Hotel there and was a publican, carpenter and property investor. As a Chinese-Australian myself, I've been in this country for more than 40 years, and I've seen the relationship between our Australia and Chinese-Australians change significantly in that time. From Max Saying to me arriving as a student in Adelaide, many, many years later, the changes must be immeasurable. To me, this lecture is a vital resource for cataloguing those changes. The contributions of Chinese-Australians to our country have often sat at the margins of our recorded history or sometimes they've been left off the page altogether. And it's through acknowledging and understanding the many contributions of Chinese Australians to the process of building our nation, practising our culture and shaping our future that we all understand where Chinese Australians fit into the Australian story. To begin proceedings tonight, I'd like to invite Wiradjuri Elder Yvonne Weldon to the stage to welcome us to country. Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, sisters and brothers. As was said, my name is Yvonne Weldon and I'm a Radruan from Cowra here in New South Wales. From the waters of the Clare, which later became known as the Lachlan, and of the Murrumbidgee Rivers. I am the elected Deputy Chairperson of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, who are the culture authority under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act for the land we're on. I'd like to pay my respects to all Elders past and present, to all First Nations, to you, and the many ancestors' lands you travelled from. We are meeting here on Eora country. The boundaries of our traditional owners are embedded into the Earth's natural landscapes. The boundaries of the Eora are the Hawkes River in the north, the Nepean in the west, and the Georges River in the south. My people, the Aboriginal people, have been a part of this land for more than 65,000 years. We are the oldest living culture of the world. And wherever you travel across this beautiful continent of ours, understand you're entering the lands of nations, tribes and clans. This existed before all written words and all history, and it continues here today. And on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, the elders and the members. I welcome everyone to the land of the Gadigal. I acknowledge the Gadigal people whose spirits and ancestors will always remain with this land, our Mother Earth. Aboriginal people are inclusive from, from all across these lands and we have hundreds of nations from this continent and across the globe. Whether you come here by foot, air or water, we welcome you. My people include everyone. We don't turn away. We honour all living things. This is who we are and will continue to be. We all are the fabric of this land, woven together with our rich cultural differences. We must work together to building and continuing a cohesive and a harmonious multicultural society that enriches the lives of everyone. And we all play an important part of accepting and celebrating our diversity. And we need to do this each and every day, bringing my people, your people, and all our people together. All of us 
can make a positive change to this country now and into the future. And we need to reflect upon the footsteps we're leaving to know where we're heading, shaping societies, countries we can be proud of. So whether it's through your work, networks or contributions, creating an inclusion, an acceptance and a resilience. All of us together can bring about positive changes to multiple generations, starting a healing to the past generations by declaring what should not have taken place. To the present day generations, giving us all hope and creating a future for the next generations for everyone in this country. We are in this together and we can achieve positive change each and every day. No matter what walks of life we all come from, we all need to support each other, bringing out hidden heartaches to share and bringing us all a strength together. Think about the difference you can make today that will become the milestones of our future, all our futures. So let us all draw upon my people's spirits as we continue on our journey. May my people's spirits walk with you and guide you as we strive forward for us all. Again, on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, welcome to Gadigal Land. This always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you. Our first guest speaker tonight is Professor Antonia Finane. Professor Finane is an historian, author, and honorary professorial fellow at the University of Melbourne. She is also a former student of Professor Wong. She studied history at Nanjing University, the city where John Yu was born and where, where Professor Wang was himself a student in the 1940s. Tonight she will share with us the story of Professor Wang, his life, his achievements and his significant contributions to the study of Chinese communities. Please join me in welcoming Professor Antonia Finane. Thank you, Adam. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Yvonne Weldon, for your very kind welcome to country. It is, of course, a considerable honour for me to be speaking this evening about Professor Wang Gung Wu, my esteemed PhD supervisor, a man internationally recognised for his contributions over a period of nearly 70 years to history, research and tertiary education in the Asia Pacific. He holds the distinguished title of University Professor at the National University of Singapore, is Emeritus Professor at the Australian National University, has other titles, but between them they reflect the transnational reach of his life uh, and his research. Between 1968 and 1986, he was head of the Department of Far Eastern History at a ANU and for a time also at ANU, director of the Research School of Pacific Studies. And in those years, he was mentor to many early career researchers, including numerous PhD students, of whom I was one, who went on to populate the history departments in Australia and overseas. He and his wife, Margaret, had a home among the gum trees in Aranda, in um, the Canberra suburbs, which I think all of us visited at some stage. Their meeting, uh, his children, Ming, May and Lan, and I think his, Ming is here tonight, so nice to see you. It's been a long time, Ming. Professor Wang's journey to Canberra was a roundabout one. His parents were from East Central China near Nanjing, in 1930, when he was born, they were living in Java, but only temporarily. They intended to go back and they kept intending to go back. They did return to China in 1936 briefly to see family and then again in 1947 where Gang Wu entered Nanjing University. But wars and revolutions kept interrupting their plans and they finally ended up back in Malaya. Gung Wu surrendered his Chinese citizenship and became a citizen of the newly created Federation of Malaya at almost the same time as the People's Republic of China was founded. So like many at that time, his family was tossed about 
on the waves of history, and that goes for his generation as well as his parents. So in 1968, 40 years after his parents had left China for Malaya, he and Margaret and the three children uh, left Malaysia for Canberra. And that meant saying goodbye to the parents, but they too intended to go back, like their parents before them. And it was quite a while before the trajectory of their uh, lives were, were to change. But 1969, uh, with the outbreak of anti-Chinese riots in Malaysia, it became more and more difficult to be ethnically Chinese in Malaysia. In the middle of the 70s, the whole family acquired Australian nationality. Those who have taken up new citizenship know that it can entail a mixed sense of gain and loss. In a public lecture last year, Gung Wu, born in Dutch East Indies of Chinese parents, long-term Singaporean resident of Australian nationality, reflected on how grateful he was in the 1950s to feel a sense of belonging in Malaysia with roots in Ipoh, where he grew up. He called the first volume of his autobiography, Where is Home? And with the title of the second volume, he seems to have answered this question, Home is Where We Are. And judging by the front cover, it sort of meant where he and Margaret were. But Ipoh did have these strong claims on him. As a student in the University of Malaya, a young Gung Wu saw his purpose as nation building. And that nation was what became Malaysia. His MA thesis was on early Chinese trade in the South China Sea, which is to say the ancient history of a phenomenon that helped build the Chinese communities in Southeast Asia. As a postgraduate in the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, he turned to the study of uh, a more China-centred study, the problem of unity and division in China. He chose to study this problem in the context of quite an early period of history. And if you want to read about this in um, English today, you still have to go back to his 1963 book from thesis. The pull of the South Seas, however, remained strong for him. Southeast Asia, Oceania, the Chinese communities outside of China. And we can see it in the names of his other uh, books and collections of essays, A Short History of the Nanyang Chinese, Southeast Asia and the Chinese, Community and Nation, China and the Chinese Overseas, the Chinese Overseas from earthbound China to the quest for autonomy, and so on. His appointment to the ANU in 1968 was as an historian of China, but it was the push and pull of China and the non-Chinese world that has consistently interested him. He's thought and written a lot about what it means politically and culturally to be both Chinese and something else, Chinese Indonesian, Chinese Australian. In 1986, Professor Wang was appointed Vice-Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong and when he left, we felt it a huge loss for Asian studies in Australia. We half expected him to come back. Instead, he went from Hong Kong to the National University of Singapore, which is the successor institution to the University of Malaya, where he studied as an undergraduate. So this was like the falling leaf returning to its roots, as the Chinese saying goes. It also, however, meant that his work, both as a scholar and as a public intellectual, found greater relevance and institutional support there than it could here. Singapore is a hub of communications in a world in which Australia just barely sits on the periphery. Around 20 years ago, Professor Wang was interviewed for a book about his life and work. For an Australian, it is salutary to read that interview. The opening questions and answers cover the critical turning points in his life up to the 1950s. The very next question reads like this. In 1968, you were appointed Professor and Head of the Department of Far Eastern History at the Australian National University. Later, you headed the School of Pacific Research at ANU. And in 1986, you became Vice-Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong. 
What is your deepest impression of your years in Hong Kong? Nothing, I think, could better sum up the danger to Australia of being or seeming irrelevant to people in Asia. Was Australia a place where nothing happened or nothing mattered to people in Asia? In fact, in nearly two decades that he spent in Australia, Professor Wang saw this country going from being a fairly white Australia to one with an open immigration policy and a growing Asian-born population. He took a deep interest in his new country, one that he retained after his departure in 1986. In 1992, a new edition of his 1982 book, Community and Nation, was published, expanded with four important essays on Australia, Asia and Chinese Australians. This reflected not only his personal experience, but also the fact of Australia's conscious pivot to Asia. And right now, when another Malaysian-born Chinese Australian has been hard at work building up Australian relations with Pacific countries, it's illuminating to read in a later essay by Professor Wang of the formative influence on him of his time as director of the Research School of Pacific Studies at the ANU. That brought him face to face with something called the Asia Pacific. He writes, that stint as director determined the parameters of my life and work for the next four decades. Professor Wang's life and work have been recognised in numerous publications directed, dedicated to him and awards. In 2007, he was one of 10 eminent persons to be awarded an honorary Doctor of Letters at, by Cambridge University on the occasion of that university's 800th anniversary. And then in 2020, the year of his 90th birthday, he was awarded the Taiwan-based Tung Prize in Sinology. The citation for that prize re referred to his groundbreaking research on the Chinese world order, Chinese overseas and Chinese migratory experience. With the naming of the present lecture series, the National Foundation of Australia-China Relations pays tribute to someone who made Australia part of that research and made the research highly relevant to Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Finane. What an incredible life and legacy Professor Wang has built. This brings me to our keynote speaker for tonight, Dr. John Yu AC. Dr. Yu has led an extraordinary life, both, both as a medical professional and as a strong advocate for Chinese Australian communities. John arrived in Australia from Nanjing as a toddler, carried ashore by his uncle's friend, Earl Page, who would go on a few years later to become Australia's 11th Prime Minister. And John grew up with his extended family in the Sydney suburb of Summer Hill. He studied medicine at the University of Sydney and embarked on a successful career in paediatrics, rising to the position of head of medicine at the Royal Alexandra Hospital for Children in Camperdown. In 1978, Dr. Yu was appointed chief executive officer and he was the driving force behind the hospital's relocation to Westmead in 1995. In addition to this, Dr. Yu is an expert on Southeast Asian art and he created a, be a best practice paediatric hospital that integrated art, design and high quality medical care for the benefit of young people. He is a companion of the Order of Australia, 1996 Australian of the Year, a designated Australian national living treasure and was appointed Chancellor of the University of New South Wales in 2000, the first Chinese Australian to take up, to take up the role. Dr Yu has made an invaluable contribution to Australian medicine, education, art and the quality of life for thousands of Australian children throughout his career as well as in his retirement. In the recent years that I've known John, I've been privileged to share in his wisdom, advocacy and mentorship most recently as we served together on the board of the soon to open Museum of Chinese Australians from which John only recently retired from his position as foundation chair. John's contributions have profoundly enriched Australian society and we are delighted that he is here tonight to deliver the inaugural Wang Gangwu Lecture. Please join me in welcoming Dr John Yu AC.
Thank you very much, Adam. May I commence by adding my acknowledgement of the people of the First Nation, the guardians and custodians of this land. I'm grateful to Adam for his very generous introduction and to Professor Antonia Finane for reminding us about the enormous debt that we owe Professor Wang Gongwu. In preparing for this talk tonight, I of course listened to the many lectures that Professor Wong has given over the years. And uh, I have to say that his scholarship and the clarity of thought that he demonstrated have done absolutely nothing to lessen my humility and reticence in standing here before you to deliver the inaugural Wangu Wu Lecture of the National Foundation of Australia-China Relations and the Australian Broadcasting Commission. I'm no academic, and a great many of you here tonight know so much more about China and China's relationship than I. I'm no China scholar, but my charge from the National Foundation has been to describe to you what it was like being Chinese growing up in Australia, which in the gold fever days adopted a policy of active migration discrimination and which then morphed into the white Australia policy. But firstly, I need to say something about my family, notably my mother's family, for it is the Young Wei family that raised me and defined my values. My four grandparents were all born in a small village just north of Guangzhou. They were Hakka, all four of them, and I believe that they were all Christian. My grandfather, Zhou Rongwei, and uh, he was listed by migration when he arrived as Zhong Youngwei, and I guess that name sounded a little bit like that. <laughs> and at least he was sensible enough not to challenge the immigration authorities and thereafter took the name of John Youngway. Even though we may not agree with migration, as was practised in those days, he made his way to the Ballarat Goldfields of Victoria. His departure from China occurred just after the Taiping Rebellion, when the national government was exacting retribution against the people, the millions who had risen against them during that rebellion. I suspect my grandfather was a refugee from that persecution. I like to think so anyway. He doesn't seem to have been a very successful gold miner. And very shortly after was recorded as being involved in the community work of the Presbyterian Church on the gold fields. He later untook, undertook studies with the Presbyterian Church and was subsequently ordained in the church. He then accepted a call by the church to establish the Chinese Presbyterian Church in Sydney. And I guess that's why I'm here today. The missionary work of the church uh, entailed a lot of con community work. It was more than just teaching Christianity. 
the church was very active amongst the recently arrived poor and struggling Chinese migrants. He chose to work with the poor rather than the rich established Chinese society of the time. Now, when he arrived, there was another group in Sydney doing very similar work, and that was the Kuomintang. And the KMT was very active in community outreach. And it's little wonder that the Presbyterian Church in Sydney and the KMT didn't work together and develop a lot of common policies. My father, Yu Zhang Yun, was the Southeast Asian representative of the KMT based in Jakarta. And Sydney and Australia fell within his remit. Quite expectedly, he got to know the Young Wei family and uh, soon after married my mother, Carrie Young Wei, who was the youngest daughter of that family. My mother and father then returned to Nanjing, which was the seat of nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, that's why I was born in Nanjing. I was born in Nanjing in December 1934. And to save you all the trouble of trying to do mental arithmetic, <laughs> I'm 87. <laughs> The next year, in 1935, I had my first visit to Australia when my parents brought me to Australia to meet the rest of the Young Wei family. I next came to Australia in the latter part of 1937 when the Japanese invasion of China, Manchuria and China, reached Nanking. And my sister, my mother and I were smuggled out of that city when it was under siege by the Japanese. We were smuggled out because my father, as a government official, like many other people, didn't want the population to know that he was getting his family out of the war zone. My family went down to Hong Kong and stayed with friends, my family being my sister, my mother and I, until we were able to get a ship to Sydney. Family folklore says that I was carried ashore as Adam pointed out, by Earl Page. <laughs> and once again, I'm told that he carried me ashore so that whilst my mother and sister were processed by immigration, there was no record of my ever coming ashore. <laughs> and that had to be sorted out later. <laughs> so, you see, I had the whole trifecta. I was a genuine refugee <laughs> from war. I was a boat person, albeit a passenger liner, <laughs> and uh, I was an irregular arrival. <laughs> and I often think that we, Australia, needs to think more about how we treat migrants, and especially refugees, we need to think and accept that sometimes refugees might have something to offer this country. And very often, some of us 
might be able to repay that debt in a very positive way by the way we live. I grew up in my grandfather's home in Summer Hill. My mother, my sister and I were supported by my mother's family. And that actually had a significant effect on me. Because whilst we were very much loved, I knew that we were being totally supported by my mother's family. That gave me a certain sense of obligation to this family and the need to in some, in some ways repay them. My early childhood in Australia was when Australia was at war and China was an ally against Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. And I think that China being an, a wartime ally did in fact affect the way I was treated by other people. I don't have a lot of memories about that period of my life. My mother was born in Australia and so it wasn't difficult for us to get our Australian citizenship and so we were treated like any other Australian family. But we were Chinese and somehow that was noted somewhere along the line. And in addition to the ordinary wartime rations, we received a rice ration. <laughs> and it reminded me that sometimes being different is not necessarily bad. <laughs> we had more rice than we needed because we only ate Chinese food during weeknights. And the rest of the rice we gave to friends and other Chinese who needed more rice than we did. Did I suffer from discrimination? No, not that I remember. Had I been called names by other kids? I don't know. But it had no effect on me. And I think when you stop and think about it, my sister and I grew up in a family with four adults. I was the youngest. We were loved and we were wanted. And as a paediatrician, I quickly realised that being loved and wanted is terribly important to children. It's terribly important in their having good feelings about themselves and having self conscious and not being self conscious of any difference. And so if anyone did call me names, I wasn't aware of it. And it certainly didn't affect me or matter to me. I think in retrospect, it clearly was. But as I said, it had no effect on me. And I was lucky about that. But there was discrimination when I grew up. We lived in a very ordinary street in Summer Hill. But we had lots of friends and they invariably came and played in our home. Uh, I guess because I always had lots of lollies at home and my mother was very generous in, in sharing it with other children. But I do remember a neighbour stopping me one day and saying, I shouldn't play with a particular boy. And when I asked why, she said, they're Roman Catholics. <laughs> we were Presbyterian, don't forget. So that, uh, <laughs> but it is interesting that the discrimination 
which was pretty rife in Sydney at the time, didn't necessarily affect people of other races and other people who were different. I'm certain, though, that that discrimination went two ways. And uh, whilst I was welcome in Catholic families, and I had a lot of Catholic friends, uh, they probably felt, in a broad sense, the same way as Protestants, that my Protestant neighbour felt about Catholics. I went to Summerhill Public School and later to Fort Street Boys High School. Again, I did not recognise any discrimination against me, and I'm pretty sure there was none. At Fort Street, there were only two Chinese boys in my year. But when we reached our senior year, we were both elected by the students and the masters. And we had one mistress, a sorry, a French teacher, but we were elected, we were both elected prefects. Again, race was not relevant. Where race became relevant was that being Chinese, I was small. And in wintertime, when I was initially made to play rugby, I had great troubles. <laughs> but at least there was sensitivity amongst the teachers. And one day, one of the sports masters said to me, you don't like playing rugby, do you? And I said, no. And he said, it's no problem if you'd rather spend the sports afternoon in the library. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and it, it actually was never held against me by anybody. That's why I talk about difference not necessarily being bad. And I'll come back to that at the very end of my talk. The members, the memories I have about discrimination are only those. And I can honestly say that I was personally never discriminated against. But that doesn't mean that Australians aren't discriminatory. You will all remember in the early days of COVID how Asians were abused in supermarkets by other people. And I say other people because they weren't necessarily Australians, but they were abused. And that was because there was this talk about it being the Chinese disease. It was description given by President Trump. But I'm pleased to say that our government and our community very quickly talked about how unfair, how wrong all this was, and it disappeared quite quickly. My student days at school and at university were happy, fulfilling times for me. My education was paid for, both at school and university, by the Australian government. I had a Commonwealth scholarship. And so there's little wonder that I feel so passionate, so strongly about public education and the need to ensure that any child is able to enjoy the sort of education they're capable of undertaking. Once again, later in my life, I don't remember discrimination. I certainly didn't have any professionally at university or as a practising doctor. But if you think about it, I practise as a specialist in metabolic diseases, that is, genetic diseases inherited that affected the chemistry of the body. And so being in a very small specialty, my patients and their families 
needed me, and so why would they show any discrimination against me? And I think this goes largely for the caring professions, that if you do something for your community, then it is extremely unlikely that the community would act differently or be different to the way they treated you. I have, however, felt uncomfortable as an adult when I travelled or when I had Chinese patients because I wasn't able to talk with them because I can't speak Chinese. And then it goes back to early childhood days when my parents, my family were determined that I should grow up to be a good Aussie. Mm. And they tried to avoid talking to me in Chinese. It took some while for us all to recognise the extraordinary ability that young people have with language and how talking to me in a second or a third language would never have compromised my acquisition of English. My family did other things in trying to make me a good Aussie so that when I was 12, every Sunday night, I was given a glass of scotch. <laughs> <laughs> and I was told that if I was going to be accepted in Australian society, I needed to hold my grog. <laughs> and I think the success of that is shown by the fact that even today, a single malt remains my favourite drink. <laughs> but I was Chinese and my family had Chinese values of loyalty and responsibility to family and community. But we were part of a very active community. I had mentioned earlier that my grandfather was a Presbyterian minister, but the entire family were involved in other work of the church, in the administrative work of teaching English, of teaching mother craft skills, of helping people fill out those inscrutable forms that we all try, to, try and struggle with even today. But I think one important part is that I am told that my uncles talk to them about being Australian and how to be an Australian. I did well at school and as a result, there was an expectation that I would do medicine. I never consciously decided to study medicine. My uncle was a GP and the whole family had been involved in caring for others. So that it's not surprising that I did what any good Chinese son would do. And I'm talking about 70 years ago, I did medicine. <laughs> and I have never regretted that. And were I given the opportunity of reliving my life, I would still do medicine. I grew up in a family where there was a lot of art around. People always give their doctors and ministers presents, and it's usually paintings, drawings, things like that. But we always had paintings, embroideries, calligraphy around the house. There were ceramics, lacquerware, and Buddhas, lots of Buddha images, which might seem strange for a Christian family. But one of the things I actually now regret is that 
lot of Buddhists converted to Christianity my, by my grandfather, gave him their Buddhas. And uh, I have to say that I personally don't approve of that. Although I still have the Buddhas and they still, <laughs> and they still remain some of my favorite possessions. I was surrounded by art when I grew up, but it was all Chinese art. And when I got to know more about Chinese art, I recognised that most of it was not very good art. <laughs> but once again, I guess that's what you would expect in a clergyman's family home. <laughs> I soon discovered Western art and slowly started to become aware of how it different from Asian art. Much of this was the result of traveling and seeing different things and developing a curiosity about the things I saw. I became curious about difference. I find it interesting that I have returned again to the concept of difference. to try and understand why things are different and why, by and large, we all like difference, be it food, art, music, or the things we believe in. If we are to value life itself, we need to be able to celebrate difference and embrace the excitement of discovery. Art and music became important to me and allowed me to relax and cope with the worries and stresses of work and after work. In many ways, this strength that art and music gave me was one of the reasons why I felt so strongly that I should try to share this with the kids I looked after and their families and with the support of the president of the hospital and the board, they allowed me to do it. They allowed me to bring art, light, gardens, nature into the new hospital. And I think there's been a critical reason why the new hospital was able to develop a sense of caring and love in a situation where there was a lot of unhappiness. The art program at the hospital was possible with people like Joanna Capon, a good friend and the widow of Edmund Capon, who many, many if not all of you would know. She became the hospital's honorary curator and our chief fundraiser for the art program. It's wonderful today to hear so many other hospitals talk about their art programs. And it makes me very proud where I hear them talking about it as their program, as though they created it. They did create it, they didn't invent it. <laughs> but it is something that's growing throughout our caring system, that we have to worry about the whole person, the whole family. And I think today, Australia can boast a very caring, healing community. Now, why am I telling you this tonight? It is to emphasise that everything I might have achieved in my life were through my friends, my colleagues, and a community that shared my values and aspirations. It has been about working together. My face, my ethnicity were and are totally irrelevant. 
Australia has embraced cultural diversity. It has been a great success and something we must value and protect. At its core is a recognition of difference as something that should be valued as a strength, accepting there is no them and us. And that's what I want my Australia continue to be. And I like to think, and I'm pretty sure, that Wong Gung Wu would agree with me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yu. There could hardly have been a better choice of speaker for the inaugural Wang Gang Wu lecture, and I sincerely thank you for sharing with us your experience, insight, and candor. Peter actually asked John in the green room before whether he kept up his weekly tradition of a dram of scotch, and John replied that he did not. In his retirement, what, is, what was once a weekly tradition has become a nightly one. <laughs> <laughs> so you could say as an assimilatory exercise, it has been a roaring success. <laughs> The contribution of Chinese Australians to the Australian nation is one that has been both impactful and distinguished. It's one that we should all strive to acknowledge and celebrate in recognition of not just those advocates and champions who have made those contributions, but for the young Chinese Australians today whose contributions are yet to come. On behalf of the National Foundation for Australia-China Relations and the ABC, I'd once again like to thank Dr Yu, as well as you all, for joining us for the inaugural Wang Gungwu Lecture. <laughs>